Welcome back to part three of this introductory survey of African American sports history. We're going to pick up right where we left off last time with World War II. So about a million African Americans serve in the U.S. military during World War II. About 125,000 of them fight overseas in what is still a segregated military, mostly under white Southern officers who aren't too sympathetic to their presence. Uh, but in the end, some progress is made. Remember, most of these soldiers fought in hopes of achieving what was called the double V, victory over fascism abroad, which did happen, and victory over racism at home, which was going to take some more time. Uh, there were some modest strides made, including uh, more equality of hiring and promotion in federal jobs, especially in war industries. And their service helped convince Harry Truman a couple years later to integrate the armed forces, which itself was a really important symbolic and uh, not just symbolic achievement. But it was disappointing to many of these veterans, and large numbers of them ended up joining uh, an organization called the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored Persons. It's been founded back in 1905 by, among other people, W.E. B. Du Bois, who I quote at the end of the first part, and it sought to achieve racial integration by confronting Jim Crow laws uh, and lynching head on rather than taking more accommodationist position of Booker T. Washington. And so eventually it makes some strides, and we'll come back to the story of the NAACP in just a moment. But here's a case where sports did end up leading the way and uh, at least gave hints of what a multiracial American society could look like thanks to players like, of course, Jackie Robinson. So this is probably a pretty familiar story, and it's told in more depth in your Davies reading. So I'll just go through some of the high points. We had mentioned that Jackie Robinson was a college athlete at UCLA, entered the military, was honorably discharged in 1944, and went to play shortstop for the Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro Leagues. In 1945, the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, Branch Rickey, was seeking to, uh, to integrate the game. This had been discussed all throughout World War II. There was political pressure from the mayor of New York. A lot of uh, white and black journalists were advocating for this, and there was a new commissioner who was at least open to the possibility. And the Dodgers were the team to do it because of Ricky. So Ricky brought, uh, had his scouts uh, go through the Negro Leagues and ended up bringing Jackie Robinson to Brooklyn in August 1945, even before the official Japanese surrender. Robinson thought he was there for a Brooklyn ne a Negro League team, but instead learned that he was going to integrate uh, Major League Baseball, be the first black man to play since the 1880s in Fleet Walker. In 1946, he integrated minor league baseball, playing for Montreal, the International League, International League affiliate of Brooklyn, and then in April of 1947, played first base for the Brooklyn Dodgers and integrated um, Major League Baseball. Again, the story is pretty well told. I really encourage you to read closely what Davies has to say, talk about how that, um, that difficult journey proceeded, more about Robinson's career. I would just point out one thing that's easy to overlook, which is that the Dodgers ended up leaving Brooklyn during Jackie Robinson's career. They won one World Series and then moved for greener pastures on the West Coast. So they became the Los Angeles Dodgers the same time the New York Giants moved to San Francisco. And that's significant because, remember, for a long time, the westernmost outpost of major league sports in America was a place like St. Louis. And this reflects the population changes that happened during the Great Depression and then during World War II. There are a lot of war industry jobs on the West Coast, and a number of Americans move out that way. So here's where you start to see professional sports reflecting the growth of a more national economy, the development of the Sun Belt, things like that. And it's significant because uh, uh, Los Angeles had a large African-American population. Uh, Robinson was only one of many former Negro League stars in the Dodgers. And the same time that Jackie Robinson was integrating baseball, the Los Angeles Rams were integrating the NFL by hiring players named Kenny Washington and Woody Strode in 1946. The NFL actually had had black players back at its beginning, but they'd been banned since 1933. So that's the story of Jackie Robinson. We'll actually hear more from him before we're done with this segment, but let's tell maybe a less familiar story, which also is in Davies, so I won't go into depth. This is Althea Gibson, one of the greatest women tennis players in history. She was a rising star in the late 1940s, but was precluded by her race from playing in the signature event in the United States, the U.S. Open, because it was hosted by Forest Hills, a New York club that was uh, not open to black players. So Davies explains why uh, Gibson was ultimately allowed to play in the U.S. Open and then the next year at Wimbledon outside of London and to go on to have a very successful career in women's tennis. 
I would just underscore here that if you're an African-American woman at this point in time, there are double, double limitations on your participation in sports and in the wider society. Uh, of course, um, if you're a black woman like Althea Gibson, you've got a color line to cross. But remember, there are also lines barring women from competitive sports. But tennis is one that women have been able to compete in for a long time, going back to even before the days of Helen Wills Moody, who we had talked about before spring break. By the way, one year after Althea Gibson integrated women's tennis, something else uh, important happened in our story. And here we'll shift away from sports for a second. In 1951, a third grader in Topeka, Kansas, named Linda Carroll Brown was denied busing in her hometown. And her father, Oliver, became the name plaintiff in a class action suit with 20 other uh, parents in Topeka brought against that local board of education. The suit was brought by then NAACP's legal director, a lawyer named Thurgood Marshall, who had decided that the time had come to challenge segregation in one of its most important battlegrounds, uh, public schools. And of course, this leads to a monumentally important Supreme Court decision three years later. In 1954, the Supreme Court rules unanimously in favor of desegregating public schools in Brown v. Brown v. Board of Education. And so here we can start telling the story of the modern civil rights movement, which includes the NAACP, but other groups as well. And of course, Thurgood Marshall will go on to fight other court cases and eventually become the first black man on the U.S. Supreme Court himself. Uh, in 1955, of course, in Montgomery, Alabama, an NAACP official named Rosa Parks decides to make herself a test case on a bus. She challenges the whites only seating, is arrested, and that leads to a bus boycott in the city, and it also brings to town one of the rising stars of the civil rights movement, a Baptist pastor named Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, by the way, Martin Luther King Jr. got to know Jackie Robinson pretty well. In 1958, they were both honorary chairs of a youth march for education in Washington, D.C., and in a moment you'll hear a testimonial from MLK about the significance of Jackie Robinson. So we're skipping over lots of things here, of course, and there are other classes you can take at Bethel that go much deeper into this important story. Uh, one moment I would just mention, in 1961 is the summer of what are called the Freedom Rides, when young black and white activists ride together in pairs to try to integrate buses going to the South. And as they get off at stations all around the South, they're, they're met with vicious violence, sometimes by law enforcement itself. And uh, it, it sets up an important pattern of this is all broadcast on television, reported in newspapers and on radio, and it helps turn the tide of public opinion and maybe more importantly, convinces the Kennedy administration to start using federal power to intervene. A year later, in 1962, uh, Jackie Robinson had retired early because of diabetes, and he was inducted into the Hall of Fame in his first year of eligibility in 1962. And in tribute, Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this about Jackie Robinson. Back in the days when integration wasn't fashionable, he underwent the trauma and the humiliation and the loneliness which comes with being a pilgrim walking the lonesome byways toward the high road of freedom. He was a sit-inner before the sit-ins of uh, lunch counters, a freedom rider before the freedom rides. So and that's a good way of summarizing the, the role that sports actually played in getting out front of social change in American society rather than simply playing catch up to it. Uh, the movement continues and again often descends into violence. In the summer of 1963, a World War II vet and NAACP official in Mississippi named Medgar Evers is shot dead in his own driveway by a white supremacist named Byron D. Byron D. LeBeckwith. One of the many responses to that is that probably the greatest basketball player in 1963, Celtic captain Bill Russell, ends up going down to Mississippi that summer to hold integrated basketball camps. Russell had uh, been an early activist in the NBA in 1966, but became the first black coach as a player coach of the Celtics. In 1964, the movement achieves its probably signal victory when Lyndon Baines Johnson, the new president, signs into law the Civil Rights Act, which ends segregation in public places. And the year after that, you get the Voting Rights Act and so on. And I should say, Jackie Robinson is a participant. In our last segment, we're going to talk more about athletes as activists uh, in this phase of the civil rights movement and moving up to the present day. And we'll talk about Black Lives Matter. Matters. Jackie Robinson is fairly unusual among professional athletes, even African Americans, in uh, speaking out, and then especially after his retirement, in being an active participant in the process 
donating money to the NAACP, uh, headlining events that, that raise funds for it, and uh, encouraging voter registration. In 1960, interestingly, he actually supports Richard Nixon, arguing that uh, blacks should not simply support one party over the other. One final symbolic moment here from the world of sports as we wrap up this quick, quick sprint through the integration of sports and its uh, connections to the early civil rights movement. In 1966, then City AA holds its men's basketball championship in uh, Maryland, and Texas Western, now known as the University of Texas El Paso, upsets the Kentucky Wildcats to win the, their first, and I think only, title. So this is significant, obviously, for a couple of reasons, and some of you have seen the movie Glory Road, which tells the story. Uh, Texas Western had a white coach, but it had five black starters. So African Americans had played college basketball uh, throughout the 40s and 50s in limited numbers in the late 1950s. Players like Russell, Will Chamberlain are significant stars, but uh, it, this is the first time you have an all-black starting lineup. And significantly, almost all of Texas Western's players were not from Texas or other parts of the South, but they were from northern and midwestern cities. These are essentially the grandchildren of the Great Migration come back down to the segregated South to defeat an all-white team, Kentucky, whose uh, head coach, Adolph Rupp, had refused to integrate his team and helped keep the Southeastern Conference from integrating. So it's a fairly s a significant symbolic moment, not just in the history of sports, but in the integration of American society. Uh, we've got this, this famous game between Texas Western and Kentucky. Now, as I mentioned, Texas Western's coach, Don Haskins, is a white man. And so here we come up against uh, maybe a sour note or at least a limitation of the kind of change that we've talked about in this segment. In fact, it would be over, it would be almost 20 years before a black coach was in the title game. The first African-American coach in the NCAA uh, Division I came in, I think, 1967. But it wasn't until John Thompson coached the Georgetown Hoyas to the title in 1984 that a black coach actually got that achievement. And so as we prepare for our last segment and we think about some of the limitations of, uh, of integration and um, in sports and American society, this is gonna be one issue we'll talk about. Players start getting access, but it's not necessarily true for black coaches, general managers, executives, and owners, or for other persons of color.